In this video, we're going to talk about uh, the idea of applying the wave particle duality notion not only to light, uh, but also to things that we might uh, think of starting off as believing in as being small particles, things like electrons, right? Uh, you're somewhat familiar with this idea, right? Because uh, you've been taught uh, in a variety of contexts to think about electrons and atoms uh, in terms of orbitals and this notion of just a delocalized charge cloud uh, around an atom or a molecule. Uh, we're going to develop kind of uh, where those ideas come from uh, in this uh, this video today. So to recap a little bit from uh, last time's discussion of the photoelectric effect, uh, light exhibits uh, particulate behavior uh, and wave behavior, right? Uh, so light, uh, which folks started off thinking about as a wave, uh, we can see there are situations uh, where we need to describe that as thinking of the light as a collection of little uh, chunks of energy or, or things that are at least sort of like particles, okay? We call those uh, particles of light photons, uh, say they have an energy h nu. Right? Photons are a little bit curious. They have no mass, no rest mass, uh, if we want to be relativistic. Uh, they travel at the speed of light. Uh, they do, in fact, have momentum, uh, and you need to invoke uh, ideas from relativity to, to uh, justify that statement, but uh, we'll just say it does work. Uh, momentum here is uh, indicated by p, right? So the, I'm sorry, I did not choose the pen. Right, so momentum uh, here indicated by P, uh, and it says uh, there's a variety of ways down there we can calculate momentum from the energy, uh, say the photon energy from the uh, uh, frequency or from the wavelength, right? Uh, so any of those would work, uh, and that'll give me momentum for the photon. Uh, what does it mean to say photons have a momentum? It, it means fairly literally that uh, when you are, are being uh, pelted by a large number of photons that they're transferring momentum to you. Uh, why don't you notice that? Because you're large and photons are small, right? So their momenta are uh, very small uh, and they don't have any impact on you. That's why, you know, when you turn on the lights, you don't feel like you just got, got uh, bombarded by uh, a bunch of, of little uh, uh, particles of any sort, right? But there are circumstances where this actually matters. Uh, and uh, we're gonna start off by looking at a couple of uh, different uh, categories of applications of the idea of photons having momentum. Uh, the first one uh, is a laboratory application. And I like this one because it's a really, what I think of as a really neat uh, experiment, okay? Uh, it's what's known as an atom trap. Uh, also sometimes referred to, or the region in the middle of this thing is referred to as being what's known as optical molasses. Uh, so what happens here? Uh, we're gonna experimentally take a set of XYZ axes and we're gonna, uh, uh, do some uh, clever optics to get sets of laser beams so that I have laser beams coming in in both directions uh, from the plus and minus directions along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, okay? I have a volume in the center of this thing uh, represented by uh, the point where all those uh, things come together in there, uh, where I've got all these laser beams uh, intersecting. Okay, uh, if I take that region in space and I inject some relatively slow moving atoms in there, Okay, uh, so that means they're, they're cold in some sense of the word, right? Because the temperature uh, of a collection of uh, atoms in the gas phase is characterized by how fast they're moving, what's their average speed, right? So I get some atoms that are already going kind of slow uh, and I inject them into that volume, okay? Then what's gonna happen is I'm gonna pick the wavelength or the frequency of my lasers uh, so that the atoms I'm injecting in there are going to be able to absorb those photons, okay? Uh, when that happens, when an atom absorbs a photon, it turns out the momentum from the photon has to be transferred to the atom, right? Uh, because that momentum has to go someplace. The momentum is conserved, right? The photon is absorbed, so uh, it loses its momentum, and so the atom takes on that momentum. Uh, what that means is if an atom is floating in this region, it gets hit by a photon coming this way, uh, that transfers a little bit of momentum to the atom, kind of nudging it in this direction. At the same time, though, there's more photons coming in from here, and they want to nudge it back that way. Right? Same thing is going on vertically and in both directions horizontally. That amounts to saying the atoms are in there and they're just getting kind of swatted back and forth uh, by the momentum from these photons. Right? As a result, the atoms are going to find it difficult to move out of that region. Uh, they're going to keep slowing down uh, if we get the lasers set just right. Uh, and we're going to get this little puff of uh, gas that's going to just be sort of trapped in that region for some actual finite time. Uh, slowing down the motion of those atoms corresponds to cooling them even further. Right. Uh, and in doing that, uh, you can get things down where the speed that those atoms are actually moving with uh, corresponds to temperatures that are on the order of micro Kelvin. 
okay? Uh, that's colder than you can generally cool anything off uh, by more traditional means. Uh, and when you get atoms, especially certain types of atoms, down to that sort of temperature, some strange things happen. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the notion of a, a very peculiar phase of matter called a Bose-Einstein condensate, uh, those the experiments that look at that are done in this sort of uh, arrangement uh, because they rely on getting some atoms uh, down to very, very low temperatures uh, where they begin to actually produce this uh, alternative state of matter uh, that has some really uh, odd properties uh, that are demonstrably different from all of the normal uh, bulk states of matter. So uh, that one is kind of esoteric, right? It's, uh, it's, it's of interest if you're uh, kind of into fancy and elaborate experiments, uh, which I am, uh, but uh, it's not really uh, what you might call a, a sort of uh, engineering in the real world sort of thing, although it does take a lot of clever uh, engineering-like decisions to build the apparatus to do something like that. An idea that is a little bit more like engineering uh, is the notion of the solar sail as a way to uh, uh, propel uh, a, uh, a satellite of some uh, sort or, or some sort of small space uh, vehicle. Okay, uh, this is something that's been considered a lot. Uh, I don't, I believe, to the best of my uh, my knowledge, it's never been really successfully deployed. Uh, but uh, the picture that's there, for example, is a, an artist drawing. It's from a NASA website. Uh, because they have at various times uh, had projects to uh, prototype some of these things and to contemplate uh, what they might be useful for, right? Uh, so this solar sail, how is it going to work? Uh, you can see it's got a large panel there, that, uh, that big square panel we made of something like mylar. Uh, something that's either going to be, uh, be be able to absorb uh, lots of uh, incident radiation or reflect it. Uh, reflecting actually turns out to arguably be a little bit of a better plan, uh, but uh, and it wants to be big so that it catches lots of uh, lots of light, lots of photons uh, if it's uh, moving around through space. Okay, so how is that going to lead to being a power source for this thing? How is it going to be able to propel it? Well, the momentum from the light uh, that impinges on the sail is going to have to be transferred to the sail and therefore to whatever is attached to the sail. Right? In this picture, uh, you can kind of see here there's a uh, there's a small uh, little payload uh, at the center of the sail there, right? and that's what it's carrying around. So we're going to do a quick calculation here. It's a physics problem, more or less, uh, that just says uh, a small spacecraft with a mass of 100 grams, it's about a quarter pound, uh, is attached to a one square kilometer sail. So this is a very large sail with a very small payload. That's part of the reason why this is uh, not the most practical. Uh, application uh, that uh, might possibly be thought up for this, but uh, is released uh, at some, uh, some altitude uh, where the solar radiation density uh, is 1400 watts per square meter. Okay, and we're going to calculate the acceleration that uh, our uh, spacecraft should experience as a result of uh, the impact of that radiation. Okay, in doing this, for simplicity, I'm going to assume that the radiation strikes my sail perpendicularly, right? That it's coming in normal uh, to the, uh, the sail. Uh, that's going to make the problem a lot simpler. Uh, if I wanted to do this more realistically, I'd have to average over a bunch of angles, uh, and I don't want to spend that much time doing this. So we're just going to pretend that the radiation is coming in uh, perpendicular to the sail itself, okay? So what do we know? We know the... Uh, the incident radiation, it said, was uh, 1,400 watts per meter squared. Uh, I have an area that's one square. I don't really need that uh, fraction there. I'm sorry. Uh, I have an area there that's essentially, it's one square kilometer, so it's going to be 10 to the sixth square meters. We'll just put that up there like that. Uh, multiply that. That says my incident uh, radiation on there is 1.4 times 10 to the ninth watts. Okay, uh, so in a one second interval, how much momentum uh, is, is striking the sail, right? Uh, and so if I take the momentum of the photons that are in that uh, 1.4 times 10 to the ninth uh, joules of energy that come in every second, right? Remember a watt is a joule per second. Uh, I'm going to say that I could get the momentum. The momentum of that light uh, is just going to be E, or I can use the total energy here. Because if I find the photon energy, I'm just going to multiply it by the number of photons, right? Uh, so this is going to be 1.4 times 10 to the ninth. I'm going to put joules here uh, because I just said I was taking a one second interval, right? Divide that by the speed of light. Uh, and when I do that, uh, I will get, according to my notes, 4.7. Uh, we got joules seconds per meter, uh, which is also going to be 4.7 in kilogram meters per second. Uh, 
So that's effectively the momentum of all of the photons that strike my sail in one second, okay? Uh, if I think about what force those photons apply to the sail, uh, then I could just say that uh, the force uh, is going to be equal to that much uh, that per second, right? Uh, which gives me the second squared on the bottom. So that's going to be that the force is equal to 4.7 newtons. Okay. Uh, to get my acceleration, I'm going to do an F equals ma, right? So I'm going to say, ah, I do that a lot. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to say F equals MA, uh, that'll give me A equals uh, the force divided by the mass, uh, which here is going to be my 4.7 newtons divided by the mass, uh, which we said it was 100 grams, so we're going to call that 0.1 kilogram, uh, divide those and we'd get 47 meters per second squared. Okay, uh, a couple of things. Number one is, again, we have this assumption that we're coming in normal to the surface. Uh, the other one is I effectively did the calculation here as if my sail is absorbing the radiation, right? Because I just gave the sail the momentum that was the photons. Uh, if, in fact, my sail is reflecting the photons, uh, which I think is what I actually wrote in the description, uh, then the momentum transfer to the sail will be twice as large as the momentum of the photon itself, uh, because the photon starts off with momentum coming this way, it reflects, so it gets turned around, leaves with momentum going that way, uh, so its, it's change in momentum is actually twice its initial momentum, right? Uh, and so in order to balance that, I'd have to take that acceleration, it would effectively be doubled from there. So uh, it does provide uh, what is, is arguably a, uh, a surprising uh, level of uh, acceleration. Uh, it relies on the fact that to get that number, we had to put a very large sail on a very small uh, uh, payload, right? So a square kilometer is, is quite a big thing. Uh, the 100 grams, uh, if we're talking about normal solids, uh, that's something like, I don't know, around the size of a hockey puck or something like that, uh, give or take, uh, is about how big that would be. And so uh, it's not, uh, something that's gonna, gonna push uh, anything like a, a manned vehicle or anything like that through space. All right, uh, so we wanna take this uh, uh, wave particle idea and uh, say, uh, if light uh, started off being thought of as a wave and is shown to be able to act like a particle, uh, people start wondering, well, can particles act like waves too? Things that we traditionally think of as particles. Uh, and the answer is yes, especially for very small objects, right? Think about electrons, uh, right? So we know that we use wave ideas to describe electrons. We're gonna do some uh, developing of the, uh, the process for doing that in the next, uh, next uh, module of the course. Uh, so the momentum of a photon is uh, given by this uh, string of equations here, right? So that's the, the ones we've just, uh, just used. Momentum of a particle uh, with, uh, with some mass m, right? Particle has mass, uh, its energy is one half mv squared. Uh, that energy has gotta be equal to p squared over two m. Uh, if I just go back into sort of classical physics, uh, and so I can take that, I can start from there, I can start from here, and I get to a result that says p, uh, the momentum is equal to the square root of two me. Okay, uh, and so that's uh, an equation uh, that gets me to there. Uh, if I take this idea and link it with that one, then I can attach a wavelength uh, to my particle, right? I can say if the momentum is square root of 2me and the momentum is also h over lambda, uh, I can take those two expressions and I'm going to equate them one to the other, right? So I'm going to take this piece and set it equal to that one. Uh, this is an idea that's due to de Broglie, uh, who actually uh, uh, puts this forth as a, a postulate. Uh, this is what we now refer to as a de Broglie wavelength. Okay. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, you take those two results, p is h over lambda, that's the, the, what we had for a photon. Uh, we take the uh, normal uh, momentum expression for a particle, uh, convert it into energy terms, uh, and that gives us this array of equations, which we could use to calculate the wavelength of something with mass. Okay, uh, that's a strange idea, right? That says that uh, you could be given a wavelength because uh, you have a mass, uh, and uh, that's not some way that you usually typ typically think about particles, right? What we're gonna do is we're gonna show that this idea can be important for very small light uh, 
particles, uh, that it's not important whatsoever for macroscopic objects, okay? So there's a reason why the uh, everyday world doesn't seem this way. Uh, it's going to be because the wavelengths of uh, things with substantial mass are going to be, in fact, sort of vanishingly small, uh, too small to be of any consequence for anything that we can really imagine. Okay, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to illustrate that by doing a couple of uh, uh, calculations, which might uh, seem a little bit goofy, uh, the, the one of them in particular, but uh, says so we're going to calculate uh, de Broglie wavelengths for a couple of different uh, situations, just to show the scales on these things. Uh, the first one is one where it's actually kind of an appropriate thing to calculate. Uh, that's the de Broglie wavelength for an electron traveling at a kinetic energy of 100 electron volts. Uh, that's an electron that's been accelerated through a 100 volt potential. Okay, so that's a relatively straightforward thing to uh, come up with in a lab. Uh, and so we'll calculate a wavelength for that. The second one is a little bit more unusual. Uh, I'm going to calculate the de Broglie wavelength uh, for a baseball traveling at 100 miles an hour. Okay, so think uh, major league fastball there or something like that, right? Uh, and uh, baseball has a mass of about five ounces. So we're gonna have to do some unit converting to fix up the ounces and the miles per hour there. Uh, but the point of this calculation is mostly in the compare the results part. Uh, that's gonna be where we're gonna make sense of the idea that uh, these wavelengths are sensible, useful things to have around for the electron, uh, but not really so much for the baseball. So let's, uh, let's do the calculation then. Okay, let's start with the electron. Uh, my wavelength equation says lambda is equal to h over square root of 2me. Right, uh, so that gives me lambda equal to h is Planck's constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th power. Down here, I've got square root of two. Uh, M is the mass of an electron, which is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 in kilograms. The energy is 100 electron volts. Uh, I don't want electron volts in there because I've got joules on the top. So I'm going to put in here my conversion factor uh, which says that 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules is an electron volt. When I do that, uh, the electron volts, uh, the joules, all those things are gonna go away. My units are gonna come out uh, eventually uh, to be length units if I do all that correctly. Uh, and so, uh, I end up, right, because I got this, this joule is in the square root, right, and so that's how the units are going to reconcile themselves. Uh, this gives me a value that's going to be 1.22 times 10 to the minus 10th meters. I would encourage you to take a second and just work through the units and make sure you convince yourself that you get to meters out of that. Uh, so that says uh, the, uh, the wavelength associated with this 100 volt electron uh, is uh, about an angstrom, right, so it's something that's similar in size to an atom. All right, uh, that seems like a distance that might be important to an electron, right? If an electron is actually in an atom, for example, uh, then uh, this says its wavelength is similar to the size of the atom that it's actually a part of. Uh, and that's why uh, these wavelengths can be important uh, things to, to uh, work with when we talk about things on that scale. Let's go to the baseball. Uh, some unit conversions first, uh, five ounces uh, five ounces. I just uh, got out some sort of a uh, unit calculator to do these, I promise. Uh, that's about 141 grams. Uh, so that's going to be 0 0.141 kilograms. And uh, if you haven't noticed yet, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place with significant figures. Uh, I don't get too worked up about those. And so what I'm writing down typically on the slides here, what I'm writing is just whatever I happen to have typed up when I did the notes for this. Uh, and uh, in uh, appreciation for the fact that I'm like that, I don't get too worked up about them, generally speaking, uh, when uh, looking at student work either. Uh, just don't get too carried away and you know, don't write down a, a 15 digit calculator display or anything like that, please. Uh, my 100 miles per hour, uh, that, if I convert that, that comes out to be uh, 160.9 kilometers per hour. Uh, that one I actually could do because my daughter is a long distance runner. So I know that uh, a mile is uh, 1609 meters. Uh, 
And so uh, if I turn that into meters per second, uh, my notes tell me it's about 44.7 meters per second. All right, uh, that's my speed. I'm gonna get kinetic energy. Uh, my energy is equal to one half mv squared. Okay, so that's equal to one half times the 0 0.1417 kilograms times that 44.7 meters per second squared. Uh, all of that should be equal to, according to my notes, 141 joules. So now I'm ready to do my calculation for the wavelength, I think. My wavelength lambda uh, is supposed to be equal again to h over uh, square root of 2me. Uh, let's just put in numbers. Uh, h is still the same as it always is. To, uh, what is it? It's 0 0.1417 kilograms. My energy is now 141.6 joules. So that gets me all done there. Uh, multiply all that out, and according to my notes, I get about 1 times 10 to the minus 34th meters. Okay. So what, is that, uh, what does that tell me? That says 10 to the minus 34th meters is a ridiculously short distance, right? Uh, so that says, if I think about my baseball as having a wavelength at all, the wavelength is very, very small compared to the size of the baseball, right? That wavelength, you might think about that as something like the uncertainty in the location uh, of the object, right? Because if I know that's the wavelength, I can say, well, it's, it's in that sort of, uh, of, of distance range, right? Uh, it's of no consequence that my baseball might be wandering around with, you know, within a region that's 10 to the minus 34th meters because the baseball itself is so much larger than that, right? <clears throat> this is why we don't ever uh, think about uh, quantum ideas for things well like baseballs, right? Uh, there's no reason to do that uh, because the, the quantization, if the energy of the baseball is in fact quantized, uh, the steps, the increments of energy are so small that there's no way you'd ever know it. Okay, uh, and so for any sort of practical purposes whatsoever, my baseball can go at any speed it wants, right? It can be going at 100 miles an hour and speed up or slow down by some infinitesimal increment. There's no restriction on that. My electron, on the other hand, its quantization is going to be important, right? Uh, and so its speed is, uh, its energy is, uh, if it's actually trapped in an atom, uh, is going to be quantized and the steps in those energies are gonna be significant compared to the energies themselves. Uh, and that's why quantum mechanics matters when we're in the realm of the small stuff. Uh, it does not matter when we're in the macroscopic world. Uh, that's also why it's a little bit hard to get your head wrapped around sometimes because you are, after all, used to living in the macroscopic world. Uh, and so thinking about ideas that don't really seem like they apply to your everyday experience can be, be difficult, right? Uh, so it's kind of an abstract subject and uh, it's uh, one that you have to, have to think about just right to have it uh, not uh, trouble you deeply. All right, uh, that wraps up uh, module number one, I believe. Oh, I'm wrong. I'm not done with this yet. I have one more topic in this video. Sorry. Uh, it's been a long day. I had some issues with uh, the, the Zoom today, and so uh, this is not my first time through this one. I think I would have remembered. Uh, the last topic in this video actually is diffraction, a couple of ideas about diffraction, uh, which I, I meant to include here because this is uh, a good experimental depiction of the fact that uh, things that we think of as normally being particles, in this case electrons, really do have wave properties, okay? Uh, what does this say? Uh, this is electron diffraction, first, uh, first observed by Davison and Vermeer in the 1920s. Uh, the picture here is not from Davison and Vermeer. It's a somewhat more modern electron diffraction pattern from uh, a graphite single crystal. Okay, when it says single crystal, that means the atoms in the graphite, the carbon atoms, are in orderly arrangements over macroscopic distances, distance scales that are, are as large as, say, the electron spot that's hitting it. Okay, uh, as a result of that, uh, the atoms are ordered in those two dimensions. Right? My electrons are interacting only with the top layer of the graphite. Uh, and so where I see those spots there, uh, the real bright one in the center, that's just a reflected electron beam, right? That's a beam that just has bounced off. Uh, but the other ones, the small spots, those are places where I have constructive interference uh, between the outgoing electron beams that have scattered off of adjacent atoms, okay? 
because my atoms in the uh, lattice in the graphite structure are spaced in a reproducible way, uh, those spots also show up in a, a pattern. Right? And in fact, from that pattern, that's one way to measure the spacing between the atoms. That's one way to study the surface of solids uh, and do things like measure the interatomic spacings is to look at these diffraction patterns. Sometimes you'll see electron diffraction uh, patterns and they might say instead of those dots, they might have a set of concentric circles. Uh, that typically just means that your sample is, uh, is a polycrystalline sample, like an ordinary uh, sort of just random scrap of metal would be. Uh, in that case, if your rows of atoms are going like in this direction in one part of the crystal, they might be going in a different direction, another part of the crystal. And so if your spot is hitting both of those pieces, then it ends up kind of taking those uh, well-defined individual diffraction spots and just kind of rotating them about the center. Uh, to produce those rings. There's a quick uh, couple of slides in here pointing out some principles of diffraction. I'm going to do these really quickly because we're not actually going to calculate anything involving diffraction. Uh, the figure, this figure is from your textbook, uh, and so uh, it's in there. You'd see it if you're uh, actually reading the book. Uh, what does it say? Let's go over to the right-hand panel because I like that one better. Uh, it says, here's my incoming electron beam, right? Uh, and it's got some wavelength associated with it. Uh, depicted here by this, uh, this lambda, okay? Uh, and when that electron beam comes in and it hits the atom on the surface, the electron beam is actually going to be much bigger than the surface atom that it's hitting, right? So that incident electron beam is not just gonna hit one atom, it's gonna hit a bunch of atoms uh, around one another, okay? Uh, so it's gonna hit this atom, it's gonna also hit this one, uh, and then I'll, I'm gonna have outgoing electron beams that have scattered off of any individual atom. Right? So it's drawn two of them here, uh, and in particular, if I were to intersect these guys uh, with a screen going like that, uh, then the two paths, this path on the bottom has one wavelength of the uh, electron beam there. Uh, the top path has two wavelengths, you can see if you count across there. So those are going to have constructive interference. So uh, that's going to be an angle at which I would get a spot showing up. So this angle theta in here uh, is related to that because that's the angle that sets this so that the difference in these two paths uh, is equal to a wavelength, right? That's the condition for getting constructive interference. Uh, and so the equation that governs that is that uh, n lambda is equal to d sine theta, uh, where theta is that angle. And if I use that, I could take the diffraction pattern and measure the angles that the spots show up at. Uh, this will let me calculate uh, kind of what is uh, d, where in my drawing over here, d shows up as the spacing between adjacent atoms in my uh, sample. Just in case any of you might have experience with, uh, with x-ray diffraction, if you uh, done any work in a materials uh, lab or something like that, it's possible that might uh, be the case. Uh, electrons and x-rays are different in that electrons generally, because they have lower energies, they interact only with the outermost layer of atoms. Uh, and because of that, the equation that governs electron diffraction is generally this one, like on the previous slide. Uh, if you look at x-ray diffraction, the equation that governs that is generally this one. Uh, that's because uh, in this case, the x-rays are going to sample into the body of the crystal. So there's depth of penetration as well. Uh, and that causes us to get a different, uh, this factor of two shows up in the equation for that. All right. So don't get confused by that again. We're not going to actually calculate anything doing either of these. Uh, in a sense, these are complementary techniques because x-ray diffraction generally will tell us things about the structure of the bulk of a crystal. Electron diffraction will tell us about the structure of the top layer. Uh, it seems like those should be the same, but in fact, they're not always the same because the top layer atoms uh, don't have any nearest neighbors on one side. And that often means that they rearrange themselves relative to the atoms underneath them because they've got a different set of forces acting on them uh, because uh, they have not got a layer of atoms just uh, above them. Uh, and so their environment is different from the ones in the, the body of the crystal. And so it's not uncommon uh, for the surface structure to be at least a little bit different from the bulk structure. The really last thing that's in this uh, particular uh, video is, is some slides about something known as the double slit experiment. Okay, uh, These are included uh, mainly because it's just a fascinating thing uh, and it's, it's kind of wild to think about. Okay, uh, If you are intrigued by this at all, if you just uh, search online, uh, even just in YouTube, you can find uh, all sorts of, uh, of uh, videos of people uh, describing this and illustrating some experiments. I think I actually left a link to one uh, in the, the posted slide set. But uh, here's how the experiment works. Imagine an experiment where uh, we've got a, a wall and it's got a couple of slits cut into it. Okay, uh, And those slits 
are going to have to be uh, sized so that they're somewhat similar to the size of whatever I'm shooting through them. Uh, in my first uh, example, I'm going to shoot macroscopic objects through there. Uh, the example says, oh, tennis balls. Uh, people often talk about bullets. Uh, anything that's macroscopic. Uh, I saw a video uh, when I was looking for things about this that uh, had somebody shooting paintballs through holes uh, in, in a wall, right? Uh, but you want the width of the slits to be similar to the size uh, of what uh, what you're shooting through them. Obviously, it can't be smaller, uh, but uh, it wants to be on the same uh, sort of general size range so that uh, we get a distinct uh, line of things going through each slit. As you might imagine, if you throw tennis balls at a wall with two slits in it, the tennis ball, uh, if it makes it through, it's going to have gone through either one slit or the other. Right? Uh, and if your source is a point source, then the ones that make it through the slit on the left are going to all land about in the same place. Ones that make it through the other slit are going to all land in about the same place. So I'm going to end up uh, with, like we see over here, with these two stripes uh, showing up on my, uh, my, my screen here, right? Uh, that would be kind of a reason for the paintball uh, demonstration, right? Then you would just see the, the paint marks there from those, okay? Uh, so you would see two stripes where they hit. Suppose we do this with waves. Uh, when I say I want the slits to be about the same size as what's going through them, in this case, that's going to mean the wavelength, okay? Uh, and so uh, if we do that, uh, and if, uh, gosh, if we're meeting in person, I actually have some uh, slide that's got a diffraction grating on it that I would shoot some different lasers through and we would uh, get to see a little bit of uh, something at least somewhat like this. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I've got a set of waves there that are a wave front that's impinging on the two slits. Okay, uh, imagine it's, I don't know, a sound wave, a water wave, what have you, it could be light. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, if it comes up there, uh, each one of my slits is going to become a new point source for the wave. So on the outgoing side, once I'm past the wall, uh, I'm going to have two waves emerging, one from the slit here and one from the other slit, right? Those two waves are still propagating uh, towards the target uh, wall over there, uh, but now there's two different waves, and so they're going to be able to interfere with each other because right, that's what waves do. Uh, they're going to interfere, uh, and so there's going to be places where they'll interfere constructively, and there's places where they would interfere destructively. Uh, so uh, if this was a sound wave, this says if I walked across here, I'd have places where the sound was large, and I'd have places where the sound was quiet, sound was loud, sounds don't get large. Uh, I'd have loud spots and quiet spots as I walked across there, right? Uh, and so my waves interfere, I get, instead of just having two well-defined uh, points of arrival, I get this interference pattern. And that makes sense uh, in the context of, uh, of being a wave, right? If I picture doing this with light, thinking about it as a wave, the equivalent would be there'd be bright spots and dark spots on there. So now let's picture doing this with things that are in the, uh, the sort of gray area, photons, electrons, what have you, right? Uh, and if I do this, the example I used in the slide here is electrons. Uh, I have an electron gun, shooting electrons, okay? And that's literally just a hot filament we'll, we'll do with an electron gun with some uh, 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 voltage on it that'll accelerate the electrons, okay? Uh, my electrons pass through two slits. I want the slits uh, to be uh, similar in size uh, to the wavelength of my electrons, depending on what energy my uh, electron gun is set for, right? Uh, if I do that, and if I'm spewing out lots of electrons at the uh, slits, what I get is an interference pattern. I get spots that have lots of electrons and spots that have none. Okay, my detector here, if I was just doing this visually with a, a large flux of electrons, I might just have a phosphor coated plate that would uh, light up where the electrons hit it. Right? If I wanted to be fancy, I could use something like the, uh, I don't know, the, the multi-channel plate sensor from the camera in your cell phone is a good detector for uh, things like this, right? Uh, and so I could use something like that to measure where the electrons hit. I'd find out there are places that get a lot of them and places that essentially don't get none. That's evidence that my electrons are acting like waves, okay? Do this with uh, a light source, uh, think of them as photons, I get the same result. Now there's some weird behaviors about this. It turns out uh, if you diminish the intensity of the electron gun, right, just get the flux of electrons dialed down so that uh, there should not be two electrons near the wall at the same time, okay, uh, where you're literally picturing shooting them in one at a time. Uh, because your electron flux is so small. Uh, even in those circumstances, you still see an interference pattern, which makes it seem like each electron is actually somehow interfering with itself. Uh, you can do a version of that experiment with, uh, with photons as well. You just have to be able to count them up uh, over a long time. And the one the video that's linked 
that I put the link in the slides, I think does have uh, an example of just watching the, the pattern accumulate over time uh, for this experiment using a, a very low intensity photon source for that. There's a lot of uh, fascinating stuff here. Another thing that's weird about this is uh, if you manage to move things and do your detection scheme so that you're detecting the things as they're right passing through the original wall with the slits in it, then you can see each one going through one slit or the other, right? Uh, so it's a really fuzzy uh, uh, part of, uh, of, of quantum physics. Uh, it uh, can hurt your head if you think about it for too much, at least uh, my head, it does that. Uh, and so uh, if you're curious about things like this, that's just a really interesting topic to, uh, to, to delve into. Uh, it's uh, another example of things that just give us uh, sort of experimental evidence, just proof from things that we can see. It says, okay, well, we have no choice but to expect except the notion that the world of things like electrons and photons is a strange place with different sorts of rules. All right, that really does wrap up uh, module number one. Uh, module number two will appear soon. Uh, that one uh, will deal with kind of the, the nuts and bolts, the, uh, the machinery of doing quantum mechanics, how we go from these ideas uh, and actually develop uh, useful things, things like uh, what we'll call a wave function to describe an electron in an atom. Thanks.